Hi there, and welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hello there, welcome to episode 100 of 1% Better, or the 1% Better Podcast. I've tried to drop that and the podcast words on it for the last while. Sometimes I forget to, but it's kind of implied. And now that we're episode 100, you should probably know what it's about. 1% Better, all about trying to help people improve develop new behaviors and become habits and go in the right direction as the arrow pointing upwards would suggest so yeah couldn't have expected i'd get to 100 episodes two years ago when i started but we're here now not going to dwell too much on the number it's more about the content and hopefully this one is right up there with the most interesting ones that i've done over the last two years certainly based on the profile of the guest who is ma and then sheila as you guess i guess you know at this point it, she is one that has created the most stir i would say from um, an interview so far when i tweeted about her being a guest and asking for some questions got some retweets that reach had gone into the millions lots of interested folks and hopefully you're now listening to the intro and going to listen to the episode all going well of a lot of new people checking out the show which is brilliant hope you enjoy this one but i also hope you check out some of the previous episodes because that is uh what would be really beneficial to you i think and hopefully folks you know you can spread the love there so man and sheila came to global attention last year from my perspective anyway through that netflix documentary wild wild country when i watched it i think i binged it over a couple of days or if even a day and i remember the early scenes where it showed bagwan coming down in a car and this lady opening the door for him and staring at him and the the, the, the focus in her eyes was wow what the hell is going on here that turned out to be sheila who was his secretary and obviously bagwan became osho afterwards yeah if you haven't checked out the documentary you probably don't know what the hell i'm talking about i would encourage you to do so and we come back to this afterwards but if you have you know what i'm on about when i reached out to sheila i was very excited that she was up for the conversation i did approach it from the perspective of leadership and lessons learned through her journey didn't want to focus just rehashing exactly what went through the documentary because you've seen it if you haven't um, as i said check it out but so i tried to take a different angle learn a little bit more about her through my coaching i'm very interested in what makes people tick and what was values they have and that's what we dug into her early life growing up we did talk about obviously the, the commune and interesting things that maybe weren't touched on during the documentary and obviously then uh, afterwards and her life in prison and learnings and lessons there so it was really really enjoyable the, the hardest part of it was the recording and the sound so this is where i give a shout out when i recorded it sheila was in her residence and the video of the interview is now up on the patreon site which you can get to patreon rob of the green check it out if you wanted to watch it but she was recording talking into a laptop and I obviously this microphone this side the sound was just really difficult and I thought god I can't throw this one away and I can't re-record it so I looked out onto the community of podcasters mainly through Facebook asked for some help on trying to sound engineer it and as always people really are great with their time giving help when challenges like this come up and a few folks helped out but one in particular that i said i would give a shout out to his name is russell bush the third i think russell thank you very much for helping me clean it up i hope even though it's not perfect right now it's as good as it's going to get so cut me a little bit of slack for that i hope it doesn't impact your enjoyment of the show so again thanks russell and also some of the pictures that i'm using in the promo sheila put me in touch with the photographer for those his name is gabriel hill as well so thanks gabriel thanks russell thanks for your help on this safe to say if i wasn't doing the podcast and i hadn't done the 90 so episodes beforehand and directed sheila to those to look at to know that i was credible i wouldn't have been able to talk with her and the lesson for me out of that is not to sit in your hands and say i'm not gonna i have this big idea but i'm not going to do anything about it i'm racked with fear what what will people think i'm not going to blah 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 all of that stuff if i sat on my hands two years ago and just said yeah i think i'd love to do a podcast and it'd be great but i won't uh nothing will come out of it so it's about taking action identifying something you're passionate about take action put yourself out there on a constant ongoing basis look for feedback listen get help and move things a little bit forward that's my little bit of advice based on what's happened for me during the last two years doing this 
Uh, it got me to talk to some really incredible people over the last two years and continuing to do so. Some of the episodes I have coming are really awesome as well. I just recorded an episode with the original voice of Siri, uh, Susan Bennett, in the last week. Uh, more to come on that. But I wouldn't have got to talk to Sheila unless I had a podcast and I'm learning so much from it. I'm hopeful that you're listening to this. I'm going to listen to the episode and you're going to get something from it too. So that's a really positive from it and hopefully it gives you some inspiration to do something challenging but ultimately worthwhile as well so as i said i could go on and on i won't i'll just leave it with if you're a new listener thank you please subscribe to the show that'll help massively with the ratings and rankings so others will will hear it and see it on their itunes charts or spotify charts i think now leave a comment and a review that would be great go to the rob of the green.ie website sign up to the newsletter there's a patreon page where there's exclusive content early cuts of other episodes of the one percent that haven't come out yet lots of stuff there and as always i'm very genuine when i say please do engage with me directly email me rob at rob of the green.ie hit me up on the socials i want to hear from you about the podcasting the episode is it good what is working what is not how can i help you get better and if i can focus on other themes or topics or guests um, i'm all ears but without your help without your feedback i'm only improving myself i guess and i'd like to help more than that so without further ado i shall hand it over to the conversation with ma and sheila I hope you enjoy and have a great weekend or week ahead. Thanks so much. Good luck. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the 1% Better podcast. And this one I'm delighted to uh, introduce my my guest, Sheila Birnstiel. Is that the right pronunciation, Sheila? Yes. Bir- Birnstiel? Or you can simply call it just Sheila. Sheila is is perfect. We'll, we'll go with that for, for the next 45 minutes or so. So Sheila, look. I think you've become very, very popular over the last uh, few months thanks to the Netflix show Wild Wild Country. Uh, that's I think that's where I first um, saw and heard of you. So that that's something we definitely we talk a little bit about. I suppose the main focus of the the podcast being one percent better in lots of different areas. I'm really interested in you as a leader and some of the leadership skills and competencies that you've used in your career and you've developed so we would definitely talk about that as well um but i'd like to start off maybe just talking about you when you were very young when you were growing up and what your your dreams and aspirations and life was like even in those early years because that's probably something that i don't know much about and uh, i'd love to, to learn a bit about that okay um i grew up with a very loving parent both my parents were very loving, very uh, caring, and uh, both were very intelligent. So I guess these qualities are in my blood. You want to know about my leadership uh, uh, qualities or the so. I never functioned as a leader. I had been interpreted as a leader. Uh, there were never aspiration when I was young that I will be this or I will be that. Only aspiration, if I would say, I wanted always to be self-sufficient. Okay. I did not want to be a burden on my parents or anyone around me. Mm -hmm. This feeling, this sense was always there though, not understanding what this sense was. I had a very happy childhood. Uh, No worries in that manner. But then also I didn't have many needs either as long as I was loved and cared for and sheltered under loving parents there was no bigger needs there were also I wasn't born in technical days as today where everybody wants to have a, 
their latest Apple or uh, gadgetry. Sure. We didn't have this gadgetry conflict in us. And it's loved by all my brother sisters. Uh, okay. It's the youngest of the six children. And okay. I'm still youngest of those six children. <laughs> Uh, very... Today also is five year old. Okay, and and when what was what was your your the line of work your 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 parents were in your your father what field was he in? My father was a self made scholar. Okay. He worked with Gandhi and the contemporary of Gandhi in his youth. He functioned as one of the trusted lieutenant of Gandhi. And he fought for independence in hand in hand with Gandhi's uh, subordinate, as Gandhi's subordinate. Okay, very good. And did you, did you I suppose growing up, did you have university on, on, in your radar? Was that something you went to? Was there an area that you wanted to kind of focus in on? My father was very education-minded. He wanted his children to have the best education that is possible in the world. So early age, he sent us to America for study. He was not just satisfied with the uh, uh, school education. He wanted us to learn in our life modern school. So at a young age, he introduced us to the uh, intellect of India like Bhagwan or J. Krishnamurti or the Kata Sahib or the different people. And he not just introduced us, but motivated us to listen to them and understand as much as we could for our age and our experience. Hmm. So listening was, was a very important trait, I guess, that you had to develop. Right. Okay. D did, um, was, was, was spirituality and religion extremely important to you in those years? Yep. No, my father was agnostic. He uh, he believed in nature existence, and this is what the children learned about it. My mother uh, had her worship, and uh, father never interfered with mother's uh, feelings of worship, and she never uh, forced us to follow her branch either. But once in a while, she would go to a festival for her festivities of the religion. She took us with her. And we, um, because it was an outing with mother. Okay. So they left it very much to your own devices to decide how you wanted to kind of focus. Father always emphasized on freedom. Freedom of Thought, freedom of feeling, and freedom of expression. These were very sacred words in our upbringing. This was the feeling around our house also. And at that time, all of our friends or family friends, they always liked to be around uh, in our house because nobody was there to discipline us and say do this or do that or don't sit there or you will make that dirty. Father said they are children and they should be allowed to do and make things dirty also once in a while. <laughs> That's that's definitely uh, uh, make mistakes. I guess is okay, right? So, uh, right. Did, he was... scolded us for mistake or so. He always made us aware not to repeat the mistake. Mm. 
very interesting lessons that you're probably learning unconsciously in those years that will hopefully help further down the road was was that that approach that your parents were taking with you different to the norm in, in the in the part in the part of india you're in or was it was it common or was that kind of a, a unique approach i don't know we lived pretty much uh, together brother sisters and parents uh father on a daily basis spoke to us about being aware being conscious mm. as a children we didn't understand it what he meant but it definitely brought my understanding when i met bhagwan then somewhere it was not just words it was then very clear ah this is what father meant and so this kind of training was given to us for example we didn't spend a lot of time with our relatives or something that the vacation days we spent time on the farm where we had even more sp- space more um possibility to have more room more freedom so on the farm uh, we had animals there and uh, can uh, spend time with them Okay, freedom seems to be one word that comes up a few times there. It's it's an important value, I guess, for you. So right. When when you went to the US to study, how did um? I suppose your perspectives change when you were in that new world and new environment. How, how did that impact you? It was a special time. Um, uh, it was time where. I felt that I didn't have to sit in a boring classroom and uh, study all this uh, required courses and things because I was able to move to fine art school where my interest was and I had teachers who were uh, modern our teachers so they left also the lot of room around and allowed us to function what would be the best uh way for the individual so there i got lucky in choice of my subjects and finding the correct professors okay you would put that down to luck do you think or or was it you know I guess more by design. Uh I'm sorry I didn't understand first. Yeah, no. Difference. You said you got lucky by by I guess picking the right subjects and professors, but but was it luck do you think or or was it was it something that you were very clear on what you wanted to focus on? I didn't look for as a strategy. Okay. I had just followed my feeling and art was always my interest as a growing up child also and then i chose a medium that also provoked a lot of stability in me which was ceramics it was very artsy digging okay. in fingers into the clay that was uh, that felt good hmm interesting and and the american culture is was what part of the states were you in was it the west coast or the east coast or i i was in new jersey east coast the ice east coast and 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 the culture is was in in the states at that time how did you find that massively different to what you were used to back home no uh i didn't feel at all because i was able to find the central freedom that i had known growing up as a child uh, 
in those days because they were end of 60s, beginning of 70s. And uh, still there was flower power, was uh, uh, people were talking about different things. Of course, I was too young to understand a lot. But when you are always guided by a feeling and common sense with it, then you find your way easy around. And I found my first husband, Chinmaya, in the first year of my school, with whom there was a wonderful harmony report and communication between us. And again, I got lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you said lucky. I think you make your own luck in some ways. All my feelings guided me correct. Mm, very good. You follow your intuition heavily. And d d even today. Even today. D did you, looking back, did you have, even in those early years, a very good sense of who you were, a very clear sense of y y you as a person? You know, a lot of people only figure that out maybe in their 40s or, or even 50s. And it takes a long time to get there. But did you sense that you knew? Who, who I am? I had a sense of uh, clarity uh, about me as a, a, not to show it, but inside I felt clear. Hmm. And I had a very clear sense of who my parents were. And uh, I never wanted to disappoint my parents in any form or shape. And this feeling was very prominent. And this mm. feeling is even today very prominent, though parents are no longer here. Mm. But I feel that I owe them for the love I have received from them or I should say, all six of us. And we have similar feelings mm. about parents mm. in us. Interesting. And, and, and what I'm, I guess, t taking from it, when I hear you talk about the freedom your parents gave you from a young age, some people could take that and, and go crazy, go wild and, you know, not... Whereas it it sounds like you had had a lot of respect for the freedom and still felt a, a strong connection to to do right by them, even though that you know we were given it. And it was always a pleasure and uh, need to be uh, doing right what parents had taught. Okay. Interesting stuff. Um, you mentioned when you met your first husband there and around the end of the 60s, the flower power, meditation and, and enlightenment and things like that were probably becoming popular in the US. Was that something you, you had an insight into at that stage? Did people go to you to say, you're from India, you must know more about this than we do? No, I didn't have any connection to meditation or spirituality, or soul, uh, and what people expressed through it. I only knew what I felt inside me, mm -hmm. and I never gave it a category. Okay. That it is spiritual or not spiritual. It is how I felt. It is, uh, I remember... As a young girl, I was working in a restaurant in uh, uh, New Jersey, and uh, this restaurant discriminated against blacks. Okay. And my blood boiled over this event. And next day, I went to um, 
NAA or the N, I forget the name of the organization. Sure. And I complained about it. I said, I find it. And I fought with the boss who was the uh, owner of it. I said, right. no, I will not participate in it. So there, there was a sense of such righteousness in me. Yeah, and you didn't put a label on it, whereas other people are probably looking to put a label or a category against it. No, and uh, my then husband, who supported me, took a day free from his uh, school and went with me to this agency because those days uh, my English was not so uh, something to brag about and to support me in case I needed support from him. So somehow my feeling of uh, correctness was always supported. Okay, so so that's really good context just I suppose to, to look at a bit about your, your background and some of those early learnings I, I guess. When you when you met first met Bhagwan I, I read that it was your father introduced you um, maybe even just for a minute or two, just that initial meeting, what was his impact on you? Or ha, 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 can you describe how he made you feel? I met him in a public discourse. So I was one of the uh, person who was around the, in a public discourse with other hundreds of people. But I remember I was sitting on a second row on an aisle. And when Bhagwan passed by me, I felt this overwhelming feeling. Tears started rolling through my eyes. I must be about 16 year old, not older than that. And then I listened to the public uh, discourse with other people. We went home and I was speechless. I don't know what I heard. I don't know um, what I interpreted. All I remember is this gorgeous man. That was the first time you met Bhagwan, but when when did you get to the point where you started to I don't know if, if the right word is to work for, for him or, or, or was there a, a point where you you know applied for a position well there was no such thing as applying for a position there were no mm. applications whoever came to Bhagwan and decided to be around him mm -hmm. they found they can do and help with. And uh, that was in 72 I met. After the first meeting, there were five years gone by. I was in US. And second time when I went, I met him in end of December. No, not end of uh, somewhere in December 72, can't remember the exact time, then I was, I spent some time with my parents and then again I met up with my husband and went to visit Bhagwan to introduce him to Bhagwan. Um, it was very important for me to share all my feelings with him and what is important for me. We had a very open relationship. Okay. Uh, and uh, that was in 73, I would say, where I got more involved with Bukwan. And Bukwan uh, asked me to participate in one of his first experiments of communal lifestyle, where he had chosen 
six people from the group around him at that time. And I and my husband were one of the, those he chose. The experiment didn't agree with me at all. I went and complained to the one, this is not for me. What was what was involved in the experiment? Was it a communal life you, you were living in one? Uh, I write about it in my book, Don't Kill Him. More okay. Uh, but it was, we were six people from different countries, different cultures, and we lived in one apartment uh, uh, in Bombay. This apartment uh, had one huge room, which was a dormitory. We were all young people, and uh, we had no barriers and things. So if you want to be together with your lover physically, you have to drop all your shame and be uh, with uh, your lover. It didn't matter who is in the room or who is not in the room. So we were like six individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I and my husband, we lived in one corner. Then another single person lived in another corner, another single, like that. Okay. Other people lived, each one in a corner, sort of dormitory style. And, and the, the, the objective of the experiment was it to to see, I suppose, learn how people can live in this environment and how the interactions can happen? Exactly. And he, uh, he gave us each a task to carry on, to work on it. My task was to take care of the household, uh, meaning going shopping and uh, things like that making sure the food is properly displayed on the table for us. Then there was a therapist who did therapies in another corner. Then he put us together in a sort of like an encounter situation once mm. a week where we had to discuss our feelings and uh, whatever comes, etc. Was uh, I was never uh, used to this or never came to such situation. And I didn't like it. I didn't like uh, uh, the integration I found was distasteful uh, at the dinner table. Um, some okay. were very greedy in their eating habits. They didn't think about that there are other people also have to eat or something like that. Okay. And these were the things I would go back and tell Bhagwan and he would laugh his head off sometimes, you know. He would smile, he would laugh, he would listen to me. My... And I would be very clear. I say I don't want to carry on with it. Anyway, the, uh, this project came to a, uh, end after three months. Okay, and and it's interesting the, the, the you use the word project, right? So it it was very much a project that was planned to say we're going to test this out for X amount of time. We'll take the learnings from it, and then was his. Was that the early stages of the, the bigger commune plan to see what worked, what didn't, and how you could expand on it going forward? I assume that that's what he was doing. Mm. Um, but the, at that time, there was no uh, commune talks. There were no thoughts of commune. Uh, or what he was planning at that time, I had no idea. Okay. And afterwards, we had moved to Pune, and I, I think in 74 or end of 73, he said, 
I should become part of the small group that was living around it. I and my husband should be there and the uh, function be uh, heads helpful to what needs to be done. And I assisted his secretary then, Mayo Lakshmi. And uh, uh, my husband did transcribing and editing work of the book. Okay. English courses. Okay, very good. So you, the, the book "Don't Kill Him" probably has lots more detail around that, and I, you know, I would encourage people to check that out. I do want to talk maybe a bit, jumping forward a little bit, when you did become the secretary, and you were working very closely. Did you then take a an approach to to look at this as almost like a business and creating? an organization uh, for the commune you know as a leader as you took that leadership position working very closely with him maybe just talk to me about your how the, what planning went into that and um things that come up when you think about it in that perspective life was very spontaneous around the world we did not see them create projects okay we did not create budgets. Right. As it came, we dealt with it. So, one day, Lakshmi wanted to buy the neighboring house for their own payment. In the cash box was not enough money. Lakshmi talks to a few of us who were close to Lakshmi and said, we need money. If we don't have this money tomorrow, we cannot have the house. Okay. So people said their ideas. And then I said, I have an idea. We will have in the morning a few thousand people coming to this course. Large percentage of the people coming are Westerners. Each Westerner has certain amount of money in their pocket. Why don't we borrow that money? And then they can take the money from us as they need it. So we functioned as a little bank. It functioned well. It was it was remarkable. And uh, we came out of the crisis. So it was like the spontaneously practical ideas or the common sense ideas put together. And uh, it functioned like that. At the restaurant, um, I watched that every day after this course, people want to go drink coffee. They drink coffee outside from the vendor, which is unhealthy because it's not clean. Right. So I talked with Lakshmi and said, how do you feel in this corner? We create a little restaurant. And at least we offer clean coffee, tea, breakfast. And she said, yeah, organize. I organized and it was a perfectly running restaurant. Yeah. It took my idea and it took one Italian woman who knew how to run a perfect Italian bistro, which functioned well. And it became one of the most lucrative area. Or Bhagwan, uh, part therapist came, Bhagwan started using the therapies as a money making business. So, what came our way, we used it and made it workable. Hmm. Did, did it sounded like you were coming up with some good ideas were those things that you could do, then just run with or, or did you have to run things by Bagwan for, for approval 
those days I went to Lakshmi, but knowing my experience as Bhagwan's secretary, I know Lakshmi ran through Bhagwan everything. Though sannyasins always said Lakshmi was in power trip, Sheila was in power trip, reality they don't know. Sure, sure. It it strikes me that you, you know, from watching the documentaries and just getting to, to talk to you, you've always been come across very calm and composed, but very good at negotiating and good with, I suppose, even dealing with conflict. Is that something you feel that you've developed over time or where that skill had come from? Is it something you just had? The clarity, inner clarity and feelings that I have are the biggest assets to, to take care of emergencies. Mm. And this I see it in my business here also. Emergency doesn't overwhelm me. I am not uh, shocked by emergency. I have a very practical mind, like my mama. My mama was very good at dealing with emergencies. And uh, you need a very clear head how to deal with me. And uh, one, every day was an emergency. <laughs> He was a, a difficult uh, person to. So, so your role as a secretary would that be kind of effectively like the the chief operating officer of an organization, or or what what it was what would that mirror to? I was extension of his arms. He stayed in his room and sat in his chair, and he, I was his outgoing personnel. How did you keep your emotions in check when the commune was growing and there was obviously a lot of publicity around it at the time? I, during during the documentary, I saw you on numerous interviews and you were under a lot of pressure. What were the the tools you used to keep yourself in, in control and and you know not let the emotions overcome? Very good question. Nobody ever asked me this question. But one was my point of slaughter. He had told me, you leave it to me, I will flow through you. I had no worries. I was not involved in how I look or how I feel. I was guided through the one and but one prepared me to say and do what I had to do. And I didn't have a conflict of my own image. I wasn't trying to maintain my image. Was fear ever anything that you had to deal with? Was, was, were you afraid? I was never afraid because I have never seen my father, mother fearful. And my father, being, is like a lion. He can roar like a lion too, if need be. My father was fearless. If you see his photos, you see this fearless man. And I lived with this fear, fearless man. As children, I remember when we would walk from our house to our farm, it is uh, four miles. And every morning we walked with him in the dark. And he would say, when you walk in the dark, you stamp your foot. Because of the stamping of the foot and tremor it will create and noise it will create, the insects and snakes will move out of your house. He didn't 
tell us, be careful, there might be snakes. If snakes happen, we will find a way to deal with them. But he told us how we can protect ourselves. And not by creating a fear in us, but by saying it is possible. These are dirt roads of India in those days when I was young. That's almost 70 years back. Okay, I wasn't walking on my first 65 years. Sure. Yeah. So things like that, and I have never seen my father in any situation fearful. Mm. No, it's, it's it's interesting that everything that we're talking about that has set you up for success when you were in that position came from maybe early in your life and certain experiences that you you had and i think that's that's a point for people listening to kind of reflect on you know a lot of those values or coping mechanisms are are there from from a very young age i guess as a secretary um what was the long term vision for for the commune and and how big it could get like was there a I know you were kind of not planning too far ahead, but was there a point where you wanted it to be a hundred thousand people and you know talking with Bagwan, was there a future plan? First, as I became a secretary of Bhagwan, find a land where we could create a communal. We can create and uh, invite Bhagwan Sanyasi on all over the world to visit without housing problem. That was the initial thing. Then two weeks, no, six or eight weeks after, Bhagwan decided to move to America. And what kind of land we need. There I got my first instruction we want to create a housing for 10,000 people. I don't have any idea of what it means, how to lay infrastructure or anything. When I looked shocked, listening to him, he said, Sila, you don't worry. I will tell you step by step what will be the next step. Like that, we have become. But but you weren't talking about Bhagwan never said in in thirty years time or in fifty years time he his big vi- ultimate vision for for the the growth it was more just that first phase and then looking ahead after that right yeah it's never what would be our horizon goal okay because there is no horizon not too far ahead it did not function. Uh, like a normal person, he always worked from a different dimension. And I function the same way now. When I began my institute, I began with three person and that was enough. As the opportunity came, I expanded to five people, then six people, then 16 people, and then to 34 people, then went down a bit uh, from 34 to now 29 people. Okay. So that's, as I suppose, as a leader, that's one of your views to, to not plan too far ahead, but maybe uh, no, you know, short term and, and focus on that. We don't. Uh, make project dealings, etc. We created uh, uh, architectural plans and things, what government require, and we dealt with it, or we dealt with comprehensive plans for the bureaucracy. But that had nothing to do with what Bhagwan's vision was, what was necessary. 
to move forward. Do you still looking back? Do you think moving from India to the US was a, was a was the right choice, a good decision? With with the the commune. My whole journey was a right, in my life is a right choice. Yeah, in these choices there are difficult moments, there are beautiful moments, there are different colors, but different shades of color don't upset me or scare me. Uh, I'm a fast student. <laughs> a student of life, I think. Um, I, I, you know, again, lots of stuff that was in the documentary. I don't want to go over all ground. Obviously, I know you. You did your time. You served time in in prison. I don't want to, and I know you have no regrets, right? That's that's clear. That's a a good way to certainly to live. What what was the the things you learned most about you when you were in prison? Was there were there things that you maybe learned that you didn't know about yourself beforehand? I didn't know that I had so much patience. And prison taught me immense amount of patience, which is now is the biggest asset in my work. Because working with handicapped people, you require patience. I did not know the value of time that I learned in time. We all talk about time on a daily basis. We say, I don't have time, I don't have time. Or, oh my God, there's no time to get it done or so. But the actual tangible time, the feeling of time, I learned in prison. Because in prison, you're only doing time. Mm. And the importance of time? And how valuable time is. So, uh, they were wonderful uh, learnings. And I use those learn moments even today. I tell my team once in a while, team has stress because uh, they think they didn't plan well or they are not in a sync with time. And I said, no, don't pressure yourself. People are more important. They will, you will find as you need it. There's plenty of time. So, so if you were to sum up maybe what makes a great leader, if you could say maybe three or four, five traits that you think a leader must have to be successful, and that's probably, uh, you know, you can define success in lots of ways. What do you think are, are very important? Most important is be clear in yourself what you want to do. And that will tell you how to go about it, remain open. As a leader, respect team 100%, trust your team 100%. As a leader, it's always be ready to take a slap on your face. Don't blame others. When things go wrong, don't push the buck to others. That is your benefit of leader that you are there. As a leader, you do introspection, be ruthlessly honest with yourself, and convey that honestly to your team and teach your team to be in a similar way. And don't be shy 
of failure. Failure is only yet another name of success. Because through failure you learn. I totally agree. I absolutely do. One one question that I had, I, I asked some people that maybe might listen to the show some, for some questions, just in relation to the, the, the documentary, were you happy with how it was portrayed? What was your sense of the documentary overall? It is not my job to be happy or not happy. The young men who created the documentary, this was their creative effort. Sure. They pulled their materials, they had inherited this massive amount of raw footage which has been brutally destroyed by the Rajneesh organization uh, who are in power now. And somehow the story exists and didn't want it that goes lost. So these young men inherited from a, uh, some television station 200, 300 hours of raw footage. And they saw the importance of the footage. Of course, everyone has their own creative interpretation. And they did their interpretation just as this podcast that you're doing, you will present it in your interpretation. Only request I would have, and I had made to the filmmaker also, please don't take my statement out of con context. Don't chop it up because it is... Uh, then that would be unfair. And I believe what I say, they have not taken out of context. Okay, good. Well, well, trust me that I typically don't chop things up when I put these out. It's pretty much the flow of the conversation is 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 exactly how we've done it. I try not to edit it too much, so it'll be... Um, exactly as we we discussed so so don't worry don't worry about that you, you can trust me but i have lived other way also enough interviews in my life where people have chopped up brutally what i say but then it's their problem not mine absolutely uh i totally hear you um and and i'm I'm generally my style is just to put it out as as it happened uh i think we're coming up near the end of the hour so i don't want to take up much more of your time i really enjoyed the conversation uh, sheila if if i ask you for one piece of advice that sticks out if, if somebody's given you advice over the years that puts you on the spot what would the one piece that comes up that had the most impact on you and maybe one that you could share that that you found useful Accept life for what it is and don't be burdened by life. To add on to that, how do you how do you how do you take that or how do you uh, live that? I live it in my daily life. And I have lived that with my father mother. I have lived that with but one and I'm living it today in my environment here. It is something when you become judgmental, then it's difficult to live with it. For example, you asked me a question about, do I feel right about the way the film presented me? I don't judge the filmmaker. And if I must judge, then I say they came with the correct intention, maybe something went wrong. If something is not to my taste. But I don't become cynical. And by not becoming cynical, one accepts not better. By not being judgmental, 
one accepts better life and its environment. Very good. And maybe just one on, on that. And it, it keeps coming up for me when I interview people and when I do a lot of reading about that ability not to be judgmental or or not to react. Um, I, I presume you might have read the book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. No, I have not read. No. You might have heard of it, but it, but it, it's um, it was about his time in, in uh, Nazi prison camps in, in the Holocaust and, and that. But it's it's how to take that moment and not judge or not react or not respond impulsively how do you manage to to do that is there anything you do to if you read a report or see something that you don't like you know how do you not react what happened in nazi era with hitler i have no uh, possibility to influence it sure but i do have possibility to make sure that in my environment, no such discrimination and atrocities happen. And from history, I can learn to not create or repeat such ugly events in my life. And that is the only thing I can take responsibility for. That I don't behave so badly. Okay. Perfect. She had a good way to end it. Um, I really enjoyed listening to your story and hopefully, as you said, it's always good when there's a question that you mightn't have been asked before. So we got a couple of those in there. Um, I look forward to sharing this. I'll, I'll let you have a listen to it, certainly before I put it out to make sure it's OK. But again, it's just going to be pretty much straight through exactly as we talked. Um, looking forward to putting it out there. Thanks so much. Same here. I wish you all the best in your life and keep enjoying it. Just like to say again, thanks so much. Have have a great day, and it was uh, it was great to talk to you. Take care, Sheila. Thanks a lot. Hey guys, just before you go, I'd love to hear from you if anything specific stood out from that episode, something you might take away and try and implement in your own personal or professional life to help make you that little bit better. On the other side, is there anything you think I could do better to make the show even more enjoyable, more impactful and maybe meaningful? So drop me a note, rob at robofthegreen.ie or connect in on any of the social platforms at Rob of the Green. We also have a community on Facebook. Check that out. If you're really enjoying the show, maybe you could try and leave a rating or a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts app, Go in there, give us a rating, let us know how we're doing. That'll help with the ranking of the podcast up those charts. The more folks that potentially see it because we're high up, the better. The more that might listen, that never heard of it before. And the goal of the show is to try and reach more and more people and have that impact more and more. So that's down to you. Please do help me with that. I'm not going down the route of hiring podcast promoters, quote unquote, from other parts of the world because they say they can help with the ranking and I don't really believe them or it's not very authentic. Help me do it in an authentic way. I really appreciate it. This year, I'm going more all in on Patreon. So it's three bucks a month. You can sign up, subscribe to Rob of the Green on Patreon.com. That will give you access to Patreon-only content. Nearly all the episodes of the 864 podcast are on there and new ones will be added only there. The 1% Better Show will have early releases there, but will still come out for free on robofthegreen.ie. There will also be live shows this year, some phone-in shows, extra content. Three euros a month will hopefully, the more folks that subscribe, allow me to do more and more stuff on there, add more and more content. At the end of the day, that's the price of a pair of socks, maybe, that you might lose, or a coffee. One way or the other, it's up to you. If you want to join, you'll still get free stuff otherwise. But if you're enjoying what we're doing, help us grow, help us expand it. I'd really appreciate that. Adding new stuff onto the website all the time. There's an affiliates page under the Be Better drop down. Check in there. There's training courses that you can sign up to. More and more stuff will come in over time. Into season three now of this fun, fun journey. 
huge learning hopefully you're getting something from it too stick with it let's keep going enjoy the journey even more have a great day week weekend and thanks for checking it out good luck